new round of changes to Florida airspace, and operators of business aircraft are expected to benefit. From the National Business Aviation Association, this is Flight Plan. I'm Rob Finfrock with your trusted source for business aviation news. COVID-19 threw a wrench in many plans over the past 18 months, including the FAA's efforts to further optimize airspace in some of the busiest skies across the country. While those plans have been delayed somewhat by the pandemic, the agency has nevertheless continued to roll out new procedures designed to improve efficiency and safety as part of its ongoing next-gen modernization effort. The latest round of changes came on August 12th, with implementation of a significant Florida Metroplex optimization that includes dozens of new procedures at airports used frequently by business aviation operators. So, how's that going so far? To get an early peek at the answer to that question, I'm joined today by Ernie Stellings, Senior Manager for NBAA Air Traffic Services, to offer his perspective from the Association's presence at the FAA's Air Traffic Control System Command Center. And to see how these changes have affected operators in the Sunshine State, I'm also pleased to welcome Sandy Showalter, Director of Aviation at Six Star Incorporated in Orlando. Ernie, how many changes went into effect August 12th across Florida, and what airports were affected? They were looking at a total of 93 procedural changes that occurred with this update. Uh, They started some of the work back in April in terms of putting some of the uh, proposed changes in, but then they had them uh, noted non-usable for that time period just to allow operators to get uh, the NAV databases and things like that up to date, charted and those types of stuff. But as of the 12th, you know, all those procedures are active and in effect. Um, the airports impacted are most of most of Florida. Uh, you've got your South Florida airports. So you've got you know Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, Boca, Fort Lauderdale Executive, Opelika, Miami International. You've got Naples. I mean, pretty much most of the major terminals, Orlando, Orlando Executive, uh, Sanford. Then over on the Tampa side, you got Tampa, St. Pete, Punta Gorda, and even uh, Sarasota. So, you know, they went through in a pretty large uh, detail of revising all the SIDS and STARS into those airports uh, for most of the Florida airports. How are these latest changes expected to affect business aviation flight crews operating in and from these airports and within this airspace, Ernie? And what are some of the benefits they might expect to see? Most of this project has been trying to transition from the old route structures to more performance-based RNAV. And so a lot of these are shifting things over to RNAV procedures. And and while there may not be huge mileage differences and things like that on some of the procedures, I think that'll be more efficient, at least for the operators in terms of putting things in the box and, and flying the actual procedures with the airplanes. Did we see any traffic management initiatives or TMIs with this transition, Ernie? We did. You know, the FA, from a planning perspective, purposely, uh, you know, came up with specific airspace flow programs for each of the different metro areas to to run just to just to ensure that it was smooth and there wasn't a lot of controller issues. The feedback I have is that, you know, things went fairly smoothly, at least from the FA side in terms of you know the procedures working and, and the operators actually being aware of what was going on and there not being a lot of problems that we've had some some, like some things in the past. Sandy, from the operator side, what have you seen regarding these changes so far? How have they affected your operation at Orlando Executive? Being based at Executive, we're sandwiched there between the Sanford Charlie and the and the uh, MCO Bravo, so it's kind of a challenging environment, and I don't expect that'll change. But for what we've seen so far, it's been really positive. Executive put two new RNAV departures in in April and put those into a more or less into use right away for those of us that could accept them. And uh, we've seen much more efficient climbs is the is the big difference. We're used to having to level our initial levels uh, 1,500, but we've been there for a matter of 20, 30 seconds max and sometimes getting an immediate climb through 1,500 to four. And then the intermediate climbs have been quicker and higher. And so that's been a really great change for those of us operating turbine stuff out of there. And in terms of the arrivals, the names haven't changed, kind of as Ernie alluded to, but the structure is certainly different, noticeably different, and noticeably more efficient. It, it's it's really great to not have to input 30 north of such and such at, at such and such and, and just being allowed to descend on the SID, and it seems to be much more efficient. We'll have more about the Florida Metroplex project in just a moment. But first, this word from NBAA. NBAA Flight Plan listeners, get ready. Business Aviation's biggest event is back and in person. Register today at nbaa.org 2021. We'll see you there. We're back now with Ernie Stellings and Sandy Showalter and our discussion about newly implemented changes to Florida airspace. 
Sandy, it's good to hear that these changes seem to be proceeding relatively smoothly so far for operators. Are there any areas, though, where you'd like to see further improvement or that might still benefit from further tweaks? I think that the the litmus test is still to come. Right now, the challenges are kind of the, the normal for us here in August. Air mass thunderstorms, you've got the normal kind of line that likes to form there along the Florida Georgia line, which I think it makes that kind of a flow constrained area almost on a daily basis this time of the year. So I think that when season approaches here in Florida, late into the winter and, and into the spring, when there's a great demand of volume of operation, I think that's really when we're going to see how this stuff works particularly from a business aviation standpoint, you know, there was some huge challenges earlier in 2021 and late 2020 with just volume in and out of Florida. And so when we kind of approach that time of the year again, late this year, early next, that's when I think we're going to really see whether this stuff has worked. From what we're seeing so far, from what I'm seeing so far, it's been great. The only issues that we've had in terms of edicts or anything like that has been the normal weather-related stuff. Nothing like Florida storms to test the system. Yeah, this time of the year, it's just something we deal with down here. And ATC does a superb job dealing with the weather down here. I think most operators who are accustomed to coming in and out of Florida would agree that they really do a good job. So we'll see what happens when the volume really takes hold. Now, these changes are just part of the FAA's ongoing modernization efforts over the past several years. That includes a sweeping optimization program now underway along the entire East Coast. So, Ernie, should we expect to see more changes across Florida soon? You know, the, these procedures that went on the 12th and the stuff that was put in in April, I mean, these were basically the, the biggest changes they were going to have for the Florida stuff uh, that had not already been done prior. You know, they've been working on this, like you said, a, a few years now and uh, rolling things out intermittently with different routes and things like that. And now these all these different stars and SIDs and approach procedures and so forth for the terminals, that was kind of the last part of this. And so I think from, from at least from the Florida perspective, you'll see kind of just post-implementation monitoring and uh, evaluating post-August 12th to see how these changes are actually being affected. How would you recommend business aircraft pilots prepare for these new procedures, Ernie? Are there any specific resources you'd recommend? NBAA has been very active in terms of trying to get the information from the FAA out on our website, out through various you know, social media, Twitter, Facebook, via our updates, uh, podcasts like this, other articles. Um, so as the, as the projects have unfolded, we've been you know, updating that information with the latest changes. Uh, COVID definitely had an impact with a lot of the timelines. You've seen a lot of these things. Like, for instance, like you said, the major project, the Northeast Quarter Project, which is you know, huge. You're replacing most of the routes along the East Coast. I mean, it's a gigantic project. was supposed to actually Actually finished last November, and then that slipped to. They thought it would be maybe this November, and then it's actually gone to next year. So you know the COVID and and the inability to train some of the controllers on the procedures has really really impacted things. But um, we're we're definitely getting getting a lot closer to the end of this. Some of the other resources that operators may want to look at as as on some of the FA pages, like the advisory database. Uh, there's always routes and route guidance and things like that that they publish on a daily basis. So uh, for operators that go in there and just take a look at that every morning before they fly, they'll see if there's any procedural things that they need to be aware of that, that they may not have caught through some other source, through NOTAMs or something like that. And then also on our website, if you look at the Atlantic Routes Project page, we actually have all the routes the, and the city pairs and the routes that they actually want you to file for most of those airports in Florida up to the Northeast and vice versa. So you can use that as an additional resource if you're looking for guidance on some of that stuff. Sandy, what tips would you recommend to other operators flying in Florida, especially those who've probably grown accustomed to the pre-optimization procedures? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And quite frankly, I fly similar trips kind of on a weekly, monthly basis, as I'm sure a lot of other operators do. So you kind of get a comfort zone built up and you, you know, you know, well, uh, if I'm not going to be able to come down the piglet, they're going to move me over to the coaster or I'm going to come down and do this or that. Well, those procedures, while they're named the same, you know, they they look a little bit different now. So I think just taking 15, 20 minutes as a flight crew before a flight and just doing a, a general overview of potential arrival routes into where you're going is going to be time well spent for everybody, particularly in light of the fact that coming into Central Florida anyway, we were not accustomed to descend via or climb via clearances, and now they're they're the norm. So doing a quick review of routes, altitudes, airspeeds, that kind of stuff, just as a flight crew before a flight, 
This is time well spent for a flight crew that either occasionally or even routinely comes down here just a heads up. Hey, things have changed and there is a little bit of a different look. So I think the things that Ernie highlighted are great. The, the resources are out there. And sometimes, again, we just kind of get into a rut as a flight crew. And it's great remedial training, if nothing else, to uh, spend a few minutes just looking at all the procedures, uh, using the resources, uh, using the stuff that the feds have put out, which is very, very useful. As mentioned earlier, the Florida Metroplex project is part of a series of similar airspace modernization efforts underway along the East Coast, known collectively as the Northeast Corridor Atlantic Coast Routes Optimization Project. Another component of that program that business aviation operators have eagerly anticipated are the new super high and ultra high routes for aircraft transitioning across airspace over Washington, D.C. That phase of the project will go into effect September 9th as scheduled, though just as this episode of Flight Plan was recorded, the FAA notified NBAA that due to staffing and training issues related to the pandemic, implementation of these new routes and the associated consolidation of some D.C. airspace sectors may be delayed further. Be sure to stay informed about these and other airspace changes at nbaa.org airspace. And that's the latest from the National Business Aviation Association. Remember, you can subscribe to all Flight Plan episodes at Apple Podcasts in the App Store. Wherever you find your favorite podcasts, including by asking Alexa or another connected device, or download them from nbaa.org. I'm Rob Finfrock. Thanks for listening, and be sure to join us next time for a new episode of Flight Plan. Flight Plan.